Institute for Medieval Studies at the University of Leeds, and um, I'll leave you to set up your... That's all right, I'll just have to um, um, Trevor has been um, studying at the University of Leeds for, since 2013 yes. um, on a PhD um, with the work entitled Conceiving Individuality and Emotions in English Retro Rhetorical Approaches to War and Peace During the Hundred Years' War. <coughs> um, he has got a number of forthcoming publications, including some on ethics of violence and war and about morally king non combatants during the Hundred Years' War. But sticking with the theme of rhetoric and language without talking about devastating chivalric rhetoric and ethics of war. Thank you, Axel. <clears throat> it's been said that people in the Middle Ages accepted war with fatalism and all of its consequences, that they didn't really care about it because it was pragmatic, normal, and everybody did it. But I think that this discourages us from thinking about the ethics of war and the nuances of narratives, and it's really important to look at them before we uh, use these texts in any uh, serious way. If you take this attitude, it encourages you to only think about why things happen, how they happen, what exactly happens, rather than what medieval people actually thought about war. Um, and I think it really does the text a disservice. As a case study, I'm going to talk about the uh, Lanikos Chronicle, which Ian's already mentioned. A lot of people say that it's useless. They don't like it. They don't really talk about it that much in their text. They say that it's dense, that it's impenetrable. I have a few examples. Uh, which is really fun. They say that it's full of crass alliterative effects and a couple of almost impenetrable puns. It's full of rhetorical excess and it's really of a useless character. Why? Because of uh, bitter partisanship, acrimonious hostility to Scottish interests. The writer was a patriotic hater of the Scots. He's patriotic and royalist, ultra patriotic, and he has a hatred and despite of the Scots. He's virently at a, he has a virently anti Scottish tone. Uh, I could go on. I have a huge footnote full of these things. They're great. Um, so the whole point is that people don't want to look at the actual rhetoric of the text. They, they want to mine it for, for facts, for things that happen, rather than actually ask what's going on in the narrative of the text. And I think it's important that we do that. Unfortunately, the editions for the text are really bad. We have a 19th century edition of the text and an early 20th century translation. None of them engage with this at all. Just, just very basically, they don't, when there's biblical quotes or allusions, they don't cite it, anything like that. So... Um, Thank goodness for search engines to help with this. Uh, examples of people using this text uh, for a study of war would, the best one that I think would probably be Cliff Rogers' book, uh, Wars of Edward III. He uses the Lanarkos Chronicle seven times, but he only uses it for facts. He doesn't use any of the flavor of the text. He doesn't really engage with uh, you know, this partisanship, this hostility to the Scots. But I think it's important that you see that rather than just there were 10,000 people. That doesn't really matter so much to me. Um, and all the details that he uses are really non-military details. He doesn't really engage with the text. He doesn't use it for anything like that. And a lot of other uh, scholars follow the same path. Overall, the Lanikos Chronicle is seen as a typical sort of political text, and it's avoided in this quest for history, uh, you know, history of quotes overall. Uh, I have an interesting quote. That uh, the narrative of the Lanikos Chronicle spoils the effect of the well-written parts, and therefore the real and modern historians' insatiable interest in reality does not find satisfaction in this chronicle. But that's not really what I care about. But it's interesting that people just dismiss it like that. Every single writer that I looked at does this with it. Um, well, most of them, at least, who, who engage with it in a, in, a, in a serious manner. But before we can use bits of its narratives to understand the past, I think we have to understand the narrative as a whole first. You can't just take quotes out of it and say that this says, this is what happened, uh, or there were so many people there, or this is why an army went to this place, or, or this is uh, what they did to the countryside or the civilians. I think it's a bit unfair. Um, it's an unfair treatment of the text. So the, the summary of my paper today in the three sections. The first section, I'm going to talk about the treatment of the Anglo-Scottish War and devastation before David II's 1346 invasion. Then I'm going to talk about David II's 1346 invasion, which is full of all this biblical illusion uh, and so dense, the, the part that everybody hates. Um, and then the final section, uh, shortly I'm going to talk about the French, the Edward III's French Wars and what tensions are raised uh, when you compare the, the portrayal of the, the Scottish Wars and then the French Wars um, and, and how, how the, the writer deals with the attitudes. Uh, what about the text itself? It's in one manuscript in the British Library and it's a continuation with alterations and additions of John of Forden and Simeon of Durham. Uh, of Hobden's Chronicle until 1201, and that's where the Lanarkos Chronicle goes, 1201 onward. 
it seems that a portion of the text is based on a lost chronicle which is given various names. Um, portions of the text are found in the Anonymal Chronicle and in a Durham Latin brute, uh, but Andy says it's not quite a brute, but I don't know, I haven't been able to look at it yet. Uh, there's only a few extracts published. You can tell that it's that, that they have a shared source in some portions because when you comp when you set them all side by side, they have blocks of text which are the same. The Anonymal Chronicle translates it into French, and in comparison to these other two texts, the Lancaster Chronicle has a lot of sloppy interpolations and again all these rude and anti-Scottish comments which don't really find their way into the other two texts. Um, people claim that Lanacost, as we have it, is split into two texts by two different authors or editors or writers or whatever you want to, want to say. Uh, they say that it's Richard of Durham for 1201 to 97 and Thomas of Otterburn for 1298 to 1346, but I don't think the evidence for this is very compelling. I think it's very circumstantial and it's a bit unfair, but everybody accepts it this way, even in, in Gransden's uh, two Chronicles books. She, she, just, she has them separated by this as two separate texts. And it's not that simple when you actually compare the two texts. Or the two texts, uh, there aren't any clear differences. The tone doesn't necessarily change right away. The language doesn't change right away. There's nothing in the manuscript that would indicate that they're separate texts, or that they were thought of as separate texts. Therefore, to to allow me to do a, a thorough study of the text in this paper, I'm only going to look at the section under Edward III, which goes from 1327 to 1346 and ends at Neville's Cross. I have sort of a precedent for doing this in that lots of other medieval texts, lots of chronicles only cover one reign and others were cut up and only read as one reign, like uh, the second recension of Geoffrey the Baker's Chronicle. Overall, the author, from, uh, from what we can tell from internal evidence, was an Augustinian canon of the Lanacost Priory in the north or a uh, Minorite of Carlisle. But again, there, there's not that much to, to determine this except for the details and the perspective of the text. Uh, so I don't think that we can really nail down who he is or where he was from, and it's dangerous to do so. But what about his treatment of war? I think that it's not really a frank, straightforward, uh, really military presentation of war like uh, Frost or, or Jeffrey the Baker might be. Some claim that he really likes war, that he likes to write about it uh, because of all of his details of war, and sometimes people claim that he's even an eyewitness or at the very least, a very serious war enthusiast. The classic example that they use for this is a siege earlier in the text that has a lot of details that seem really real. The Scots go to, go to, um, to siege a walled city, and they, they bring in this very interesting contraption with, with hooks and, and ropes and everything. But it doesn't really make sense when you read it. And then they're warded off because there's guard dogs on their bark, and the Scots run away. However, this is actually a mashup of ideas from Vegetius, Vitruvius, and William of Tyre, and uses their language, uh, if not the ideas themselves. So it's, it's unfair to say that just because there's details that aren't found somewhere else, that he's therefore an eyewitness and he's really serious about war. Overall, his presentation of the Anglo-Scottish Wars, again, excluding the Neville's Cross campaign, is there are 27 campaigns, 10 sieges, 3 battles, and 5 skirmishes. Uh, I don't di differentiate between campaigns and just border raids because the author doesn't. They're exactly the same for him. He doesn't make any differentiation. They use the same language. They have the same sort of destruction. If you, if you look at this, and as you read it, it's just campaign after campaign, burning, burning, burning. And it really suggests that the writer thought the wars were mainly just fought by devastation. They weren't necessarily fought by battles or sieges or anything like that, because he doesn't care about them. He doesn't treat sieges and battles with any detail, as we might expect in a text like this. He gives them a little bit of attention, but it's nothing major. It's not like Geoffrey the Baker's 30-page treatment of Poitiers. It's nothing like that. Uh, he rarely uses any military terminology, and it's only really in basic, unnuanced uh, ways, and you don't really get anything out of it. He doesn't talk about anything that we care about, or that uh, like proper military history would need. It doesn't talk about movements, doesn't talk about causation really, doesn't talk about what's in, a, in an army or, or what's really going on. There's nothing there. And when there is variation, it's really only for the sake of variety. There's no real reason behind it. It's nothing special. If we just look at the translation by Maxwell, the early 20th century translation, we'd think that overall the writer of the Land Across Chronicle doesn't care about devastation because how he presents it is just frank, formulaic, and repetitive. It's just the same thing. The, the, they went through and they burned the land. They went through and they burned the land. They, they attacked the land. Da, 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 da. Um, it's all the same. But if you actually look at the text, it's very varied, um, which is really ignored by the translator. And he uses a huge array of words to describe destruction and devastation. Uh, I didn't know that you could describe burning in so many ways. Uh, and I tried to make sure that, that I have different uh, words for each one so I can actually set it apart in my translations. 
But it's, it's really fascinating to me. And nothing like this comes across when he's talking about actually the military things. It just says miles, you know, or milites. It's nothing special. Um, and again, this does not come across, across in the translation at all. It's just a straightforward translation. Everything is put into the active voice. Everybody, the, the Scots attack the land. The English attack the land. It's, it's nothing special. So you would say, well, what's the point in looking at this? Because it's all just straightforward. He didn't care, just like so many other chroniclers really don't care about it. Um, but when you actually look at the text, there's a lot of variation in the language. In the first quote there at the top, it says that the Scots invaded and burned up Galloway and led away spoil and cattle. But a lot of time he describes it indirectly in the passive voice or with future passive participles. And he says that, uh, for example here, Cumberland and other areas were devastated by slaughter and blaze. He didn't say who did it or that it was done by people. It was just done. This is consistently applied. It's not just random or, or, or in there for any particular reason. The Scots have eight direct devastations in the text, uh, and three of them are indirect, whereas the English, it's almost the exact opposite. English and allied, uh, where it's four direct and nine indirect. And this is, this is consistently applied throughout the text. A lot of the time, the English are justified in their acts. There, there, there's a rationalization for it, or it's a revenge for something the Scots did. The Scots very rarely have anything like that in the text. And I think that this implies that to the writer, or, or he thought that his audience would think that this act was inherently immoral or, or censure-worthy. Otherwise, there's no reason to really dump it onto the Scots and give them increased agency and uh, try to remove the agency of the English in these acts. And again, there's no reason why this might be done. Otherwise, the text is in prose. Uh, you don't need to put it in there to fit any verse or meter. Um, and nothing else in the structure of the text. It's not very elegant until the 1346 campaign. There's no reason why this could be here. No other constructions might require it. Um, overall, when he talks about devastation, it's, it doesn't always include the victims. There's often just, you know, again, they burned, they destroyed. They don't really talk about the, the people who are actually getting killed uh, or attacked or wounded or injured or lose their livelihood before the, the Neville's Cross campaign. But he does, uh, he does imply that civilians were always targeted in these, in these acts. He makes a point of, of uh, saying that in one of the campaigns that when the army attacked the land, they killed few people and found hardly any, which suggests to me that he thought that normally they were attacked and he just didn't find the time to mention it in his text. Uh, you get this a couple times in the text. And I don't think that we can assume that he thought that some attacks were inherently less violent than other ones, as some scholars might say. Uh, I think he thought that here it was abnormal for them to not attack people, and it's just a matter of whether or not they actually portray it, uh, that we, as readers, might think that he's actually attacking the land, or that the, they're attacking people, sorry. And it presents most devastation in this section really similarly. Uh, regardless of the real scale, scale of destruction or any royal sanction, it's all presented the same. But he doesn't personalize devastation at all. He doesn't talk about these victims. He doesn't talk about Bob the farmer getting attacked or murdered or, or his wife, Sarah, getting led off into, into uh, pseudo-slavery in Scotland. Um, the overall presentation of devastation by the Lanarkos writer suggests that it could be attributed to a group to paint them as immoral or bad. And nationalism might come into it. Uh, of course, his perspective is from an English person, uh, from an English perspective, and he wants to sort of make the Scots into the bad guys because they're being attacked. And nationalism is part of this. But the vehicle of the nationalism in the text is devastation. And for it to work as it does in the text, it has to be thought, as, thought of as negative. In the 1346 campaign by David II, you get a lot of personalization. This is the section that nobody likes, and the editors aren't helpful at all. It's very, very, very colorful. Um, for example, they start the campaign, or he starts the campaign, by saying that from the root of sin in Scotland proceeds stems of heresy, from which trees certainly small twigs erupted, carrying with them burdens of their own acts, fruits and uh, leaves of great confusion. And there are a ton of quotes like this. I just chose the first one, but I could go on and on and on. I could spend the whole paper talking about just this uh, and, and where, the, where it's coming from. There's a ton of allusions. I'm only going to mention a few. But the, the, the gist of it is not that they're making the Scots into this sort of scourge of God, that they're punishing the English for anything bad that the English did, because there is nothing like that in the text. The English aren't doing anything that's inherently bad. They're not, the, the writer's not showing them that way. Um, and if they did portray them, if the writer did portray them as a scourge, then you couldn't criticize these acts. It couldn't be bad. You'd have to be accepting these acts. You can't really engage with it uh, in the way that it's presented. 
Instead, the overall thrust of this section of the text, of the 1346 campaign, is solely to paint the English as the new Israelites. They are now in God's favor, and the Scots have fallen out of favor, which I'll, I'll discuss later on. The English passed the test by coming out victorious, not necessarily by beating the Scots, but by being victorious at the very end. It's a, it's a demonstration of divine will, or at least divine endorsement of the English. And you see this consistently with the language, with all the biblical allusions. That's really what it's all about. And uh, overall, and I'll talk about some of the quotes later, uh, overall the invasion is heavily personified in David II, King of the Scots. I'll just give a couple examples. Uh, I'll start with the infamous defecation story. Uh, this is the only verse in this section of the text. Uh, there's verse earlier on before 1327, but this is the only uh, verse in Edward III's reign. It says, uh, when describing David II, King of Scotland, it says, Not, however, that David whom Christ sanctified, but he was that David who dishonored Christ, which he proved well when he defecated upon the altar, but he sinned more greatly when he burned to ash sacred temples. It's, it's, it's very fun. Um, this is changed in, in Maxwell a little bit, so they, they change it from, uh, from uh, I forget what exactly they change, but they, they make it so you don't really think about the fact that it's during a baptism. This shows up in a lot of other texts, only English texts. I don't think there's any Scottish ones that talk about this. Um, later on in the Lanarkos Chronicle, they call David the Second David Cacator, David Defecator, sorry, David Cacator. Um, there's a big-ish poem called On the Battle of Neville's Cross in Wright's Collection of Political Poems, uh, I think there's something like 20 or 30 lines on this specific topic, and it goes on and on and on, and I won't uh, burden you with it. Uh, Thomas de Burton has it, and Geoffrey the Baker mentions it. He calls him David Dritt Outen, which is apparently a mix of Middle English and French, which means, according to the translation in, in the new edition, uh, David the altar shitter. Um, and again, it also shows up in the brute. It, it's, I, I think these chroniclers thought they were really funny, uh, because it, it's great stuff. But again, you, it's very weird. The, lo the long verse poem uh, on the Battle of Neville's Cross, uh, in Maxwell's translation, he has a footnote when he's talking about uh, the, the, the four lines of verse on you know, David Cacator. And he, when he, he has the first ten lines of this Battle of Neville's Cross poem there, in Latin only. He doesn't translate it. And he says that they will not bear translation, and the rest I did not to care to quote, even in the original Latin. So it's, it's that bad. Uh, it was just funny that, that in uh, translation in 1913 that he just couldn't handle it, and he thought that you know, nobody would want to read it. It's that dirty. It reminds me of the early Loeb Classical Library editions where they bolderized everything or put it into Greek because nobody can read Greek. Um, so yeah, so I think that the Chronicles thought this is really funny because they talk about it again and again and again. But this does happen in real life, more so with boys, as I hear from my, my friend Matthew Beckman the Friar, uh, from personal experience where you pour warm water on them when you're baptizing them, and then they loose everything. Uh, it brings up interesting problems of how to deal with uh, that water, because it's holy water. You have to do certain things with it. Uh, so again, it happens in real life, but it's not talked about in text that often, and it's important. So this can't just be a representation of what happened, uh, especially considering it doesn't show up in that many texts. It shows up uh, for other kings, too. You see it in Malmesbury and Huntington for uh, Ethelred the Unready, which is actually supposed to be the ill counsel. And that's the whole point of this sort of act. It's sort of like a warning that they were counseled that if you keep doing this, bad things are going to happen. All these texts are written after uh, everything already happened. So the idea is that here, it's not just saying that, you know, David's a dirty guy. He, he, he can't control himself. It's more so that he's immoral, he's sort of like against God, things like that. Um, and that he ignored the warnings, and he persisted on his path, and that makes him even worse. So despite knowing that his acts were going to lead on his path, he still did it, and it was very immoral. Of course, this is after the fact. Um, but it's just the English Chronicles interpretation of it. So what did David II even do in this campaign? I sort of skipped over that. He corrupted the Scots. He convinced them to invade. The text says, this is after the, the root of iniquity quote that I gave you earlier, says, for in those days the sons of iniquity went forth from Scotland and persuaded many, saying, Come and let us extinguish England of people, and the name will no longer be remembered. And the speech seemed good in their eyes. And I think this is really pointing towards genocide. It's supposed to be really, really, really bad. There, there, there's no way that this can just be war. This is, you know, genocide. Um, throughout this section of the text, devastation is nearly always portrayed with biblical language and, and heavy allusions. Uh, and the writer paints and associates the Scots with the enemies of the Israelites. For example, uh, with various quotes and allusions, he, he, he compares them to Antiochus, Nebuchadnezzar, Haman, Jabin, da da da. There's a lot of them. And again, he always uh, portrays the English, associates them with the Israelites. So, so it's always very split. But again, you don't get this unless you really, really dig into it because the additions don't help you. 
Um, and what does the text actually do with objective uh, devastation? It really appeals to the sort of censure-worthy nature of attacks on individual people rather than groups or the land. So I think it appeals to, to Gratian's idea, basically, that you can't attack pilgrims, preachers, clerics, monks, women, or the defenseless poor, or anybody else, basically people who shouldn't be attacked. Uh, that's the whole idea in this section of the text. He always portrays their being victims. He always says uh, who they are, that they're, they're, they're specific people, and they're always within these categories. Shortly after uh, going through all this biblical stuff in the beginning of the campaign, he describes them start uh, the, the beginning of their attacks on the land. And he has two attacks on churches, one right after the other. There's like a sentence between. First one says, Therefore, coming to Lanarkas Priory, where the canons dwell, venerable men and devoted to the Lord, there entered with pride into the sanctuary, threw out the vessels from the temple, seized the treasury, broke the doors, took the jewelry, reducing all that they could into nothingness. And again, this has lots of sort of biblical allusions in it. Um, shortly thereafter, it says that David, which is to be deplored, totally stripped bare the aforesaid priory, I think it's uh, Hexham, on that occasion and on others, for the army of the Scots lied there for three whole days. David was glad to burn up, destroy, and persecute the church of God. It's not very praiseworthy at all, I don't think, and I don't think this is just an objective portrayal of what happened at all. It's a very specific purpose, and the tools that it uses for that suggest what the attitude is. And right after this, there's a very long lament, but it starts with a quote. It says, a voice was heard in Ramah, and it did not wish to be consoled. This is a reference to the massacre of the innocents in the Bible. So the whole idea is that the victims are innocent. They should not be attacked. This is a very immoral act. Um, and I think it's supposed to be criticizing these attacks. And then the long lament, shortly, shortly after this, right before the, the battle or the campaign for the battle starts, says that, the scourges of the, of the lamentable weak, the groaning of the younger people, the sicknesses of the mourning, the lamentation and wailing of all the people can hardly be reckoned by any alive. Truly, each husband took up lamentation, and those who sat in the bonds of marriage mourned without cheer. Young and old, virgins and widows, all cried aloud publicly. It's sad to hear little children and orphans wailing in the streets, fainting from weeping. The, the, the idea here is that, again, he's appealing to individuals as being, they shouldn't be attacked, so you see what's actually going on with them. And these are all categories of people who really shouldn't be attacked. Not, nowhere does it say that they're combatants or that they're veterans or anything like that. It's meant to inspire the sympathy of the reader, which happens in the text. So you see it happen. So if you didn't take the hint already, then you're supposed to feel that way uh, right afterwards when it shows that the Archbishop of York sees this happen, and he says, oh, no, this is terrible. And then he rallies an army to fight against the Scots or defend against the Scots, really. And when we actually look at the battle, it's entirely nonviolent. There's no descriptions of any feats of arms. Anything that comes close is really just presented in elusive language. I won't bombard you with a bunch of quotes. I think there's about three or four really interesting things, uh, like about uh, a preacher who had a cudgel, but he didn't hit them with it. He just gave them benediction with it. It doesn't say that, that he's actually being violent, um, but it goes on and on. And then he, somebody gave uh, somebody uh, a draft of his drink, but they didn't want it anymore uh, after he gave them so much. Uh, but there's only one bit of violence, and it's at the very end, but it's formulaic, and it's really sort of a lament. Um, it's not unlike the after Agincourt and the Gesta Henrique Quinti, Quinty, where it's sort of, you know, not supposed to be a positive thing, but sort of a, a lamentable thing that happened, all the violence, all the dead uh, that resulted in the battle. The very end of the battle, it concludes uh, not with any sort of real martial praise or anything like that. It doesn't praise the English for beating them or killing the Scots. Or, or, or demonstrating the bravery or anything like that. Instead, it says, it was not by human agency or strength, but by prayers of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Cuthbert, confessor of Christ, David, and the flower of Scotland, by the just judgment of God, fell into the pit which they themselves had made. So, the English are now in God's favor, and the Scots have fallen out of God's favor. And this, this is an allusion to the Psalms, and the same exact thing is done in the Gesta Henrique Quinti. Well, sli slightly paraphrased, but it's the same use of the same psalm uh, after the French are defeated. And the whole point of that psalm is that, in its context, uh, it's, a, it's sort of in the context of the Israelites failing, and they're going into captivity after they're failing. So again, it parallels the Scots. They're falling out of divine favor, as the Scots are. Overall, we see a very dense narrative of this campaign, and it's completely different from the earlier ones. Why? People don't say. Maybe it's because he just hates the Scots. I think it's more complicated than that. I think it's because it's the very end of the text. It's sort of the cap on all the wars that have been going on against the Scots. 
and seen as sort of the final push, the, 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 the final victory, the fi final deliverance from the Scots. Um, and the battle happens, and then David's in captivity, and it's over. Straight. Other texts do the same thing with Cressy. Murmuth does it. And you see it at the Battle of Poitiers with the Anonymous Chronicle and uh, Geoffrey the Baker as well. So it's not, uh, or for an early recension of the Anonymous Chronicle, sorry. So it's, it's not uncommon to do this with texts. So the purpose of this isn't just so the war's over, but it's really so that it ushers in peace, uh, as I'll talk about in a quote at the very end of my paper. And the author was also probably affected by this invasion if he was at Lanacost or uh, Carlisle in some way, or at least he heard of it or saw it. Or perhaps it was because of the unprecedented scale. But again, the problems here that, 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 that the writer addresses are universally with attacks on the land and non-combatants. There, there's, there's nothing else that they really complain about so much. When they complain about him, the David II being impious, it's because he's attacking the land and churches and things like that. Therefore, how does the writer deal with the French wars? I think it's very different and dangerous to, to sort of compare the two, but you can still get something out of it. The French wars are very different in this text. They're, never do the French actually attack the English land. There's a few mentions of them raiding the south coast, but it's never connected to anything that the English do. So the, 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 the attacks can't be self-justified for that reason. They don't really focus on anything else. So when the English go through and devastate the land, as I'm sure we all know about this, uh, it's very problematic for the writer to deal with this. So you get, get lots of long descriptions in other texts, but you don't really get it in the Lanacos Chronicle. Um, and again, if the, the writer didn't care about this, if he didn't really care about the ethical problems of devastation, if he did indeed think that it was just normal and pragmatic and every day, then he would have just prevented it, or presented it in a straightforward manner, like Baker, Knighton, and a lot of other chroniclers do. There's only four campaigns in the Anglo-French War that are presented in the text, but I'll just talk about Cressy because people have heard about it, and it's in the most detail in the text. In the campaign, the writer of the Lanarkos Chronicle refuses to talk about devastation personally. The only time he talks about devastation is when Edward III does it in an interpolated letter, which goes from, I think, from the landing at the, the beaches all the way to Caen. So, that's the only part where it really talks about them attacking the land or the French civilians or anything like that. It's, it's, in the text, it's clearly marked off as a letter, whereas the Anonymous Chronicle, the, the text that shares lots of bits with it, has the same letter but in, integrates it into the text. It's made into part of the prose, whereas here it's clearly separated. In this letter, Edward III praises military actions in military terms. He talks about achievement, human action, violence, things like that. Um, Again, it's, it's all about praising what his men did. This is very different than Lanarkos' treatment of Neville's cross. Uh, after the sack of Khan, the Lanarkos writer takes over again, and he uses just short, pithy phrases to describe the rest of the campaign. The Battle of Cressy, which we see huge descriptions of in other texts, is in one sentence. Edward III engaged in a grave battle, and he overcame his adversary. That's all we get. We get a casualty list afterwards, but that's not really that exciting. It doesn't really say much. Um, again, it's, it's very strange considering how important this battle was thought by lots of contemporary writers. You can go on and on and on. Um, in the Anonymous Chronicle, it's far longer, far, far more detailed. And all the other narratives tend to be more detailed than this. I don't think you can really get shorter than, what, six words. Uh, in Livingston and DeVries' forthcoming source book, I think they said there were over 50 or 60, a huge amount of sources on the battle and campaign of Cressy. Why is it so short? I think that, obviously, in the light of the, the perception of war that's in the Neville's Cross campaign, that it suggests that it's the same attitude here. And you can actually see this when he says, that, why the English one? The English one because it was as the Lord concedes, and the battle was ended not by human, but by divine power. And I think here it shows that the writer didn't think about martial importance um, as being important, uh, but rather that just should just be set aside entirely didn't really care about violence as being good or feats or anything like that. The whole point is that he's praising divine will. And this is meant, I think, as a statement to contradict Edward III's letter. And I think it's fairly clear when you set this all side by side and you look at how Edward III treats the achievement of his men. And it really fits in perfectly with the perspective as demonstrated in Neville's Cross. So I'll conclude by talking about that quote that I said I would talk about, the Benedictus. So this quote shows up between the Neville's Cross campaign and the Cressy campaign. You have the Cressy campaign, you have one sentence describing the beginning of the siege of Calais. It's not finished because the text ends before the siege finished in 1347. And then you have this, this little quote here. 
It's clumsily put in, and you can tell that, it, that it's added. Um, the quote at the top is the one in the text. It says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, because he visited and made redeemed his people and raised a horn of salvation for us from the house of David, our enemy. This is really important to talk about, because when you read the text linearly, as we do if we read the whole text, you see all the achievements in France, da, 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 then you see this, and you say, oh, wow. This is praising the martial achievements because it mentions David. But that's unfair. If you look at the translation, Maxwell's translation, it really confuses this. He says, in the house of David, his servant. That's at the bottom. But that's unfair because that's not what the text says. So the, this is not from Luke 168-69. This is from the Benedictus. And you can tell because it has Dominus there. That's not in the Bible. That's in the Benedictus. The Benedictus is sung every morning, everywhere. Everybody knew this. So they would notice that this has changed. If you look at the, uh, the actual changes in it, the things that are italicized, what's changed is that it's, again, from the house of David, in the Mikinostri. So Maxwell doesn't know what he's doing and thinks, oh, well, it, it must be Marshall. I'm just going to make it fit. But that's not fair. In the Mikinostri is an apposition to David. David's in genitive, so is in the Mikinostri. In the Mikinostri is describing David. He is our enemy. So how can this possibly be a reference to Edward III. There's plenty of references to Edward III as being King David, but this is probably the worst way to praise him because it just doesn't make any sense. This has to be a reference to David II. And, it, and there's a lot of other puns that I don't have time to go over where the English chronicler, Lamcross chronicler, thinks it's really funny to say, oh, King David, he has the same name as David II. Let's, let's laugh about this. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't King David, but it was you know, David II, David Kakator, that did this. And I think there's five that I count on. I think this is one of them. This is the beginning of the campaign. And it seems odd to have something like this at the beginning of a campaign. And that's a, that's a fair point. But, again, it's from the Benedictus. It's sung every morning, so I think it fits as an opening to a campaign. Um, but, again, it's, it's sloppily added. If this was supposed to be about Cressy, it probably should have been before the mention of the Siege of Calais. It doesn't make sense to have it be after the Siege of Calais started. Um, but again, right after this, you can tell that it's inserted because he starts out by saying, you know, in the year 1346, David, da, 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 da. So it, it, it seems that it's added later by the final writer of the text. But again, he kept everything that he wanted for the purpose that he had. Why does this matter? If you look at the context of the actual Benedictus, it's not military at all. Just because it mentions David doesn't mean it's talking about David in a martial sense. Uh, Again, everybody knew it. Everybody noticed the change. The whole thing isn't about war. Rather, the context of the quote is about John the Baptist leading the way to Christ and so that he can lead the way to peace. The text, the Benedictus, concludes with the hope that Christ will guide our feet in the way of peace. There's nothing about war at all. This is all about peaceful, nonviolent stuff. This is about deliverance from the enemy. And that's what you see in the Neville's Cross campaign as a whole. So this serves as a, as a perfect opening to the Neville's Cross campaign. It sets the tone and gives the reader the purpose of the final campaign, not to have them beat the Scots, but to have them come out on top in the end, you know, by not talking about violence at all. It's a demonstration of divine will and ends the war, and again shows the English as the new Israelites, which is not an uncommon thing. And again, th this matters because if you think about the Cressy campaign, if, if you attach this to it, it gives it a completely different idea, which I, I think it's going to end up in the source book, unfortunately. Um, overall, in conclusion, I hope that I've demonstrated that the existing thinking about devastation and the Lanacross Chronicle is wrong, or at the very least needs major revision. And I think we should apply a more nuanced approach to narratives, especially ones that are really difficult and obnoxious like this. Uh, and I'm not sure at what level they can really be used for sort of mining detail, especially uh, things that seem to be independent and unverified, military events and things like that. But overall, I think that the text is valuable for thinking about the very perspectives on the ethics of violence and war, and all narratives, again, especially the dense ones, I think deserve a thorough study before it's used in any sort of military sense. Thank you.